Tina. Okay, thank you, Karen. Looks mm -hmm. like we've got 33 on the line right now. That is a great turnout. Um, this morning, I would like to introduce you guys to Tina Laidlaw. She will be presenting on the overarching considerations in assessing water quality data. Tina is with EPA Region 8 with the Monitoring and Assessment and Water Quality Standards team, so she's experienced when it comes to assessing water quality. Uh, actually, Tina and I are on a number of work groups together, and she always has something very insightful to say. Uh, she also works with tribes in Region 8, and she is delighted to speak to us today. So uh, for now, if everyone who is not speaking could go on mute, uh, Tina will begin her presentation. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the, in the chat box, but we will have time at the end for Tina to answer all your questions. Go ahead, Tina. Great, thanks, Selena. And everybody can see my slide, hopefully, right? Is that everybody sees yes. the intro slide? Okay, great. And maybe we'll get a chance at some point here to, to kind of do introductions um, and see who's on the call. It looks like there are quite a few people. So and we do have quite a bit of material. I did notice Colin Larrick from Mute Not Mute is on the call. And Colin, um, thanks for joining. This is actually a a series of that we did in person as a water quality assessment training right before COVID. Um, so last year in early March, before everything kind of shut down, we did this training. So Colin, feel free to jump in because you've heard this presentation before. So just so you know. Um, so I'm going to be covering kind of a number of things today. And this these slide decks are kind of provided by headquarters and then we modified them a little bit. Um, but the purpose of today's module is basically to highlight you know, what kind of data you might want to be looking at when you're thinking about doing water quality assessments, uh, what things can influence water quality that you want to be aware of, and then also where are data sources that you can go to. So beyond your own data, what other data might you want to consider, and then what whether you're considering your own data or whether you're considering other sources of data, so kind of what should that QC process look like? So we're going to pull in some of the CRAP components um, that I'm sure you guys are also familiar with because I'm sure you all have claps. And feel free, uh, Selena or Karen or Maggie to chime in with anything I've forgotten, or if there's any questions, feel free to pause at any point in the presentation. Um, so we're gonna be talking today about data needs for water quality assessments. And so there's a number of questions that you might be interested in asking with your water quality data. Uh, the focus of these this series is really what if you're trying to determine attainment are my designated uses met or if you don't if you haven't yet established designated uses and you're interested in knowing whether the water body is can support aquatic life uses or is supporting its recreational uses those are what i'm referring to as water quality assessments um, so one of the things we need to first consider is whether I'm doing a recreational use assessment or aquatic life use assessment, or maybe something, an assessment for agriculture, the data types that you're gonna need and you're gonna wanna assemble to do those assessments is gonna differ. Um, so the first question is, what kind of data do you wanna use in the assessment? And then where can I go to get that information? If you haven't done an assessment, one of the things we'll recommend is start with your own data and use your own data first. And then as you grow your program and you get used to doing these analyses and the assessments and certainly looking for other sources of data and pulling that information in is really invaluable. Um, and then also when you get that data, you wanna make sure before you just analyze it and apply it for an attainment decision that you actually know that it's of particular quality. So in yellow at the bottom is a regulation. You guys, I wanted you to be aware of this. It's kind of one of those that a state when they're developing their integrated report must meet this requirement and it requires that each state assemble and evaluate all existing and readily available data. Um, all is within the, you know, the extent of being reasonable. We know that there's always more data and information out there than people have time and resources to analyze. But certainly if this is something that you all are applying for uh, treatment as a state for 303D, then this is a regulatory requirement that you would need to be meeting um, for those of you who are doing water quality assessments and you're not trying to do TAS for 303D, it's still just a regulatory requirement for you all to be aware of. 
Um, it's not one that you have to meet, but I think it's good backdrop for kind of what as states develop their uh, integrated reports and their 303D lists and requirements that they need to meet. So, in terms of assessments and what we're looking for for our data, when we go out and collect monitoring data, you're trying to cover kind of, you're, you're hopefully able to make sure your data are inclusive. So whether you're looking for parameters that are gonna help you evaluate whether aquatic life uses are being met, um, if you go out and you just collect E. coli and you want to actually be able to, to do an aquatic life use assessment, um, you may not have collected the right data. So you want to make sure it's inclusive and it's parameter specific based on the question you're trying to answer. You also want to make sure you've collected credible data so that at the end of the day, you can feel confident in the decisions you make. Um, you want to make sure it's robust. So if there's concerns with aquatic life use and you have an upstream mine, and you only collect data during low flow regimes, then you may have missed um, some impacts that may occur or elevated concentrations that may occur during runoff. Um, so, or similarly for nutrients, you may wanna collect data focused on the growing season. So it's really important to think about, and this is where, you know, kind of the monitoring question drives how you set up your study design. And now you're hoping that the data you've collected will help you answer those questions. Um, and then, of course, we're also trying to be efficient. So we're trying to get the most bang for our buck and not spend a ton of money on, on data collection. So you're trying to balance. You'd always like more data, but we all know that we have resource limitations. So this is just a start on a list of different types of water quality data. It is by no means comprehensive. Um, I broke it down into field data. So these are parameters that you can often collect with a, a field probe. Um, some of these data can actually be collected now continuously with SONs that are deployed and are collecting data on 15 minute intervals, hour intervals, it can vary. So a lot of the field data we can now collect continuously, which if you have the resources to do, can often be really insightful and illuminating. We often also collect lab data, so samples that are collected in a bottle and then sent back to the lab. This is just kind of a suite of different types of lab data that often get a some of the main stressors we see out there on different tribal lands. Um, there's also a biological component. Many tribes are collecting macroinvertebrates. There's also E. coli. And then there's also diatoms or phytoplankton if you're uh, sampling lakes. And then there's also a suite of physical habitat parameters, things like uh, substrate, what the bank conditions are like, pools and riffles. And we're gonna talk about each of these in more detail. So this is going to, this next session is going to be kind of a, a review for you all. I think many of you all are familiar with these types of data. If you're at this point in your program, you're trying to just say, well, we've collected it. Now we want to analyze it. Um, so we're just going to take a quick scan through a lot of these different parameters. And just as a reminder, say, you know, here's a reminder of why you might collect pH or why you might collect nutrient data. We're not going to do a deep dive and apologies in advance if this is repetitive and just, you know, you guys already know this information, but we wanted to at least touch on this. So just highlighting a little bit about pH. pH is basically a measurement of the hydrogen um, ions that can, in, and it can reflect, that are in the water, and it can reflect either how acidic the water is or how basic the water is. And so this chart on the right basically gives you an indication that if you're actually sampling or using distilled water, you'd expect to see a pH concentration of around seven, very neutral. Um, higher pH values indicate more basic con concentrations. So things like bleach would have higher pH standard units as the unit of measure, uh, versus if you were looking at acid mine drainage or anything that's more acidic, Coca-Cola, you're getting down into the lower pH values of around three or two. So if you see low pH values, uh, you're concerned about the acidity stressing the aquatic life. If you're seeing higher pH values, that could also be a signal that you have some nutrient enrichment going on. And so the, the range that you're typically looking for is usually um, states or tribes have adopted criteria that are somewhere in the 6.5 to 9 pH range. And outside of this range indicates potential impacts to aquatic life. Um, some sources, this is by no means constant, comprehensive, can be mining activity, wastewater dischargers, 
discharges, nutrient enrichment should be on this list, and also acid rain. So moving on to DO, and I should mention pH is one that is again a continuous sound. Um, I'm assuming most of the attainment work and the assessment work you guys have been discussing through these webinars is going to focus on grab sample data, but we certainly want to recognize that there's a wealth of information that can be obtained with continuous data loggers. So DO is another one where you can have a DO SON deployed, um, or you can just go out and collect a grab sample for DO. Obviously, if um, for dissolved oxygen, it's the amount of oxygen in the water that's available to aquatic organisms. And different aquatic organisms need different amounts of oxygen in the water. So if you're, you know, this figure on the right basically highlights the fact that some um, organisms can live in very low oxygenated environments um, with one milligram per liter or two milligrams per liter of oxygen in the water compared to trout, which even within the trout category, there's a range. A rainbow trout may require less oxygen than say something like cutthroat trout um, or more sensitive uh, threatened and endangered species. So the more oxygen, the better. Um, but then also similar to pH, when you start to see really high oxygen concentrations, it may be an indication of nutrient enrichment as well. Also, when you go out during the day, we expect dissolved oxygen to fluctuate during the day due to photosynthesis, DO concentrations are going to rise. And so this is always the, question, the issue where if you can go out and collect the DO sample, the best time to collect it is in the early morning. Um, and that's due to the fact that during the nighttime, there's very limited photosynthesis and there's a lot of oxygen that's being consumed um, and due to respiration and just oxygen consumption by bacteria. And so those DO concentrations tend to be the lowest that we'll see them in early mornings. And that's again, often best captured with a continuous sond. The problem with low DO is that it can cause aquatic life use to move. If you're in a lake and you have um, your oxygen supply is depleted and you don't have any refuge, or if you're in a stream and your oxygen supply gets really low and there's low DO concentrations, fish or other aquatic organisms will look for kind of pockets where there may still be um, more oxygen available. Otherwise, it can cause fish kill, it can impact spawning and larval development. Um, it's also tied to increases, things that increase water temperature. So whether you have a discharge or you've removed the riparian shade, um, you will often see that uh, cooler water can actually hold more oxygen, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if you increase the water temperature, it can also decrease the amount of oxygen that's available. Um, decomposing organic matter. So this is where the nutrient enrichment component comes in. If you have excess algae or you have some kind of wastewater treatment plant, you can also see impacts to dissolved oxygen. So when you're looking at your DO data, and the reason why we're going through all these parameters is you're going to be looking at these data sets and then you're going to try to tease it apart. Well, are these concentrations that I'm seeing normal? Are they at concentrations where I expect to see an impact to the use that I'm concerned with? Or you know, and, and if they are, then what might be causing it? So that's kind of why we're framing this parameter conversation the way we're framing it. Temperature uh, is simply a measure of how hot or cold the water is. And as everybody knows, it, it can vary as well throughout the day. It's also, um, if you have increased temperature, as we were just talking about, it can reduce your dissolved oxygen. Um, it also can affect aquatic species life cycles. And so again, a lot of us, you know, you'll know that you're gonna, if you're a fisherman and you wanna go out and fish the lake and it's a really warm water lake, then what you're gonna expect to find and be able to catch is gonna be very different than what you'd see in kind of a, a cold water lake or reservoir. This figure on the right is um, for those of you, and again, this is most relevant if you're working in lakes, but it's also recognizing that temperature can affect lake, what we call stratification. And stratifications where different layers set up in the lake so that in the spring you may because of wind because of temperature you basically have uniform temperatures throughout the entire lake or reservoir then in the summer it's going to set up and it's actually going to be warmer at the surface and then cooler you'll have this area called a thermocline which is kind of where you rapidly see changes in the temperature and then it gets 
cooler down towards the bottom of the lake. In the fall, they may have turnover again. And this is, the, I should note, this does not apply to all lakes. Some lakes never stratify, just given their depth or where they are located. But if you're in an area where your lake stratifies, it's important to know that you, you will see um, different temperature gradients from the top to the bottom of the lake or reservoir. And then again, in the winter, you may see stratification with some of the colder water at the top. Um, so this is just, again, something to be thinking about. This is why if you're sampling a lake, we really strongly encourage everybody to collect profile data so that you can actually, especially when the lake stratified, you can know kind of, okay, where is are the warmest parts of the lake? Where is that thermocline? And what is the, the extent of this area, this refugia? What do the DO concentrations look like in that part of the lake or reservoir? So some things that can affect temperature, there's a whole range of things, whether weather, uh, climate change can affect temperature, uh, riparian shade, if there's dams. I think one thing to note with dams or with temperature in general is that we often think of temperatures if they're too hot, that's a problem for aquatic life. However, it's also important to note that some species like pallid sturgeon, if it's too warm in this area downstream of the dam, that can be as problematic for fish species as well. And so it's not just that things are always a problem if they're too hot, being too cold can also have an impact on aquatic life as well. Um, industrial dischargers um, also can be discharging warmer water into water bodies. Um, also, you can have increased temperature from having suspended particles in the water. And then we just covered lake stratification, and you can also see things that affect temperature could be groundwater input. So just a number of things to keep in mind as you're looking at your data. So turbidity, and I should note for each of these slides, I tried to highlight the unit of measure at the top. Um, turbidity is often measured in nephilometric, nephilometric turbidity units or NTUs. Um, we have also recently seen some FNUs, which I'm not really sure, I, I think it's Franklin, have to remember what that one is, but if folks on this line are using other units of measure for turbidity, we'd be uh, curious to know and, and know how that we're not as familiar with those different units of measure. So I'd love to hear more about that. So for turbidity, turbidity is basically measuring how clear is the water as it relates to suspended materials. And it's looking at both inorganic matter, so how much sediment is in the water. So as you can see from this picture behind you, it's a pretty turbid river. Um, it's pretty uh, muddy looking, so it could be a lot of sediment. Um, it can also relate to organic matter. So turbidity can also you know, be, you could basically have reduced water clarity because you have a lot of algae growing, again, in a lake or reservoir or a stream or river. Um, the problem with turbidity is that increased turbidity can actually clog fish gills. It can affect larval development. It also can affect like your interest in getting into a water body. Um, there's also just impacts in terms of safety. So if you were to dive into a lake that looked as brown as the river behind this uh, on the back of this slide, the concern would be, well, is that really a safe thing to do? Do I can I see below the water surface to know what I might actually hit my head on? Um, so it's tied to impacts and recreational safety. It's also tied to algal blooms, and it can affect also drinking water and how well drinking water uses can be met um, because it's harder to remove. Um, it's, it's removable, but it affects the drinking water treatment process if you have more sediment that has to be removed by the drinking water facility. Um, linked to this, of course, is excess erosion. You can have erosion from stream banks. You can have a large rainfall event that basically turns your normally really clear stream into um, you know, kind of a muddy water body. It's also normal, it's also important to note that depending on when you sample, if you go out during runoff, that's a naturally occurring event and you would potentially naturally expect to see higher turbidity concentrations at that time. So for a lot of these parameters, you also, it's important to be able to overlay them with flow so that you can get a sense of, you know, kind of what are the natural factors that are also affecting um, the concentrations that you're seeing or the conditions that you're seeing. Um, we mentioned excess nutrients and then also discharges can contribute to increased turbidity. 
So that was kind of the suite when there's others, we didn't go over conductivity, but if anybody has questions about specific parameters, we can talk about those. Um, this was kind of focused on the core suite of parameters that's been highlighted in some of EPA's tribal guidance. So that's kind of why we picked some of this subset, um, but we recognize it's by far, it's far from a comprehensive list. So those were the field data. Now we're kind of moving into the laboratory data. So something you collect a sample for, you send it off to the lab, and then you actually can have it analyzed and you get the results back from the lab. So in the case of nutrients, we lump together nitrogen and phosphorus. You can measure them in either micrograms per liter, milligrams per liter. Um, nutrients are an essential, an essential element for plants and animals. So you need nutrients. It's just like grass. You need nutrients to grow. It's the question of how much, you know, too much of a good thing can be problematic. So the problem with excess nutrients is it can cause um, algal blooms, which can then result in lower DO concentrations. It can then cause changes in the composition of the algal community that's growing or the diatom community that's growing in the stream or river. Um, it can increase the number of cyanobacteria that you see that can produce toxins in a lake or reservoir. It can also result in filamentous algae growth, which impacts aesthetics. It can also change the bugs that live there. Um, and then in terms of impacts to human health, it can also affect drinking water supplies if you have elevated nitrate concentrations. So what are the, some of the sources and things to think about as you're looking at nutrient data? Um, there's runoff from fertilized yards, cropland and manure, wastewater treatment plants. If you have a um, wastewater treatment plant, you live near, you're sampling near a large city, um, septic systems, if you're in a lake or reservoir, you can also have um, internal loading from the reservoir, from the phosphorus that actually has absorbed to the sediments. Um, or you can actually have natural, uh, naturally high pockets of nutrient concentrations, especially related to phosph phosphorus-rich geology. I should also note that in some cases, we gave you a range of values that are kind of EPA's recommended criteria or may have been adopted eventually by states or tribes as values to compare against that operate as kind of your functional water quality standard. Nutrients is one where we do have some EPA recommended criteria and they're often eco-regionally specific. So if, if you're starting to analyze your data and you're like, gosh, I don't know what to use for a nutrient value, then contact your regional counterpart and they can give you um, values e either from EPA's guidance or from EPA's draft criteria. Um, for lakes and reservoirs, we're working on some draft criteria. Uh, for turbidity, sometimes you'll see that you may need a reference to reference conditions. And so you may wanna sample high quality sites so you know how variable turbidity is and what those ranges are at reference sites compared to the sites you're sampling. Um, so, and then I should also note that what's in progress are a number of fact sheets that are going to be kind of short and sweet on nutrients and a number of the parameters we just covered, and that'll highlight where you can also go to find some of those threshold values for comparison when you're analyzing your data. And those will be out hopefully in the next year. So E. coli, we're moving into kind of biological data. I didn't cover metals. But you know, metals is another one that if that's an issue of concern because of the land use or because there's mines on your reservation, um, then certainly that's one that we can, you know, again, provide the criteria and EPA and states have often have adopted criteria for many metals that you can compare against. E. coli is one where, again, that's just a refresher. I think many of you probably collect E. coli. It's one that's kind of an indicator or organism and used to identify the potential presence of other bacteria or viruses that could cause especially GI illnesses in people who recreate in and around the water bodies. And so this is one that if you have a beach area or if there's a, a, a swimming hole on a river, then you may wanna actually collect E. coli data. You may wanna co collect it more intensively um, so that you know whether or not you should be advising people not to swim in that particular um, section of the beach of a lake or reservoir or that particular stream or river. Um, again, there's a number of sources. This is one where EPA does have a recommended 304A criteria. So there's numbers on the books you can compare against. 
and potential sources are anything from agriculture, from livestock, it could be getting into the stream, could be septic systems, could be wastewater treatment plants. Um, and this is one where if you see elevated concentrations, you know, there's, there's the attainment piece and then there's also the, hey, what do we wanna post in terms of health advisories? So if you're collecting these data and you see elevated concentrations, you know, certainly talk to your EPA counterparts at the region and see what you should be doing in the short term and then longer term for attainment decisions as well. And then macroinvertebrates are one that a lot of programs collect. You can measure them. Again, they're measured in comparison to a reference condition, and they can be measured with individual metrics, or they can be measured as an aggregated index that looks at how you know, some macroinvertebrates are really tolerant to certain pollutants. They may be um, tolerant specifically to met metals, or they may be really intolerant, and they may you may see changes and you'll see certain bugs that are present when you have really high quality waters. And then once you see a particular stressor, whether it's nutrients or metals, those organisms may be replaced with um, macroinvertebrates that are more sensitive and can tolerate higher concentrations of the particular pollutant. Often we're looking at abundance and diversity um, when we're kind of looking at macroinvertebrate data. And so it's important when you're collecting your sample to make sure that you are using kind of a standardized count um, so that you know, again, that your data are going to be comparable, especially when you're looking at metrics that reflect abundance and diversity. Macroinvertebrates, you can sometimes tease apart key signals related to individual pollutants of concern, um, but a lot of times they also kind of respond to multiple stressors. And so that's why EPA actually has a whole process for states or tribes that are saying, hey, we have impairment if, when we look strictly at the macroinvertebrates. But then the question is, well, then what's the pollutant of concern? And so we have a whole process called stressor identification that helps you determine, well, is it something with the habitat that's causing the impact to the bugs? Or is it something in the chemical composition of the water quality? Or is there something else going on that we just need to be aware of? Um, and so that's a process we can certainly provide more information on for folks that are interested. This is just a fun slide that shows you some of the adult and larval stages. So again, dragonfly you might find around a lake or a reservoir, mayfly larvae, sometimes stonefly larvae, maybe um, much more um, indicative of high water quality, high quality water conditions than say something like certain mayfly or even caddisflies, it, it will vary. So each of these different species of mayflies may be more pollutant tolerant or intolerant. It just varies. But this is to give you a sense of what they look like in the water and then also out of the water. And then habitat data. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to take those off. There we go. <laughs> Um, so this is just to give you a sense of you're going to see different habitats. And of course, whether you have more vegetation that's overhanging the stream versus one that's really cobble dominated, it's going to influence the types of bugs that live there. It's going to affect your water temperature. You know, so collecting information on habitat is really important. And then looking at that habitat data so you can see, you know, what might be telling me in terms of is my channel overwidened? Have I lost my repa my riparian? Um, canopy, so it's no longer shaded, and that may be what's contributing to elevated temperature. And you're trying to basically collect this data in the field and then tease it apart using individual metrics or looking at individual parameters, such as width and shape or bank slope um, or canopy cover, and using that to kind of also inform what is going on in terms of water quality and what you're seeing in terms of the biology. And again, habitat can be affected by a number of things, erosion, sedimentation, you can have, you know, crops that are, have removed the riparian buffer. And, you know, again, instead of having additional shading, you've got crops that are going right up to the stream, stream bank, um, and just general land use changes that might be occurring that can result in downstream effects in terms of entrenchment to the stream channel um, or changes in terms of the width and depth of this channel. So this is just to give you a sense that you're, when you're pulling together your data, you're not just saying, oh, I'm gonna analyze my water quality data, that you're looking at it holistically, that you're hopefully basing an attainment decision, especially 
depending on the use you're looking at. When you're looking at aquatic life uses, it's great to look at both chemical, physical, and biological information and pull that into your attainment decision. Okay, so I'm going to pause there for just one minute and see if there's any questions, because that's just to give you a flavor of some of the types of data that you might be interested in, you know, kind of using in your assessment. But then there's also a bunch of different sources of water quality that we're going to cover, like what do you pull together to do your assessment. So I want to pause there and see if there's any questions or anything that anybody wants to add. Hey, Tina, I would like to add something really quickly. Um, the, the FNU for turbidity is um, Formazin Nephilometric Unit. Um, and that is something worth noting and something to, to watch in your meters because FNU is not equal to NTU. Um, the, the FNU actually uses an infrared light for the sensor, whereas the NTU uses white light. So there is a bit of a difference there. Thank you, Selena. Yeah, it sounds bad when I say FNU, but, <laughs> anyway, but um, it is definitely one that we've seen. And, and we have some tribes that have collected some data in NTUs and then some in FNUs, and then it becomes problematic in terms of data comparability. Right, exactly. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Is there a conversion factor for FTUs to NTUs? There have been studies about that. Um, and I know we ha in Region 6 have collected some papers on it. So um, I can try to locate that information and I can share that with Karen and she can share it out. Okay, sure. Thanks. And Selena, for your region, do you have a recommendation or is it just be consistent and pick one? Is one more we, than another? We like to recommend the NTUs um, because that's what we have more information on and about. Um, we, Like I said, we have done some research, uh, I know. Um, I don't believe any of our tribes have approached us, but we did have a state approach us about using the FNUs and it was determined that they should stick with the NTUs because that's how their standards were written. So if a tribe were to come to us, um, we might go revisit that, that research. Rob, are you on? Do you have anything to say about this? Uh, I just echo what uh, yes. you said. Yeah, uh, just because the standards are written, and I don't have a clean conversion factor. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of one. I'm, I'll admit that I'm not up to date on it, but I do remember, you know, about a year and a half ago, looking for something, and there was nothing real clean, uh, you know, to convert. And since the standards are in MTU, um, yeah, like like you said, we support using the MTU. Great, thank you. I'm so glad you're on. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, this is Philip Corvett with the Chickasaw Nation. Um, for like the macroinvertebrate collections and maybe even fish collections, are there preferred SOPs that the EPA prefers the uh, tribes follow? Selena, do you want me to answer that or do you want to answer that for your region? Um, I would defer to Rob on that, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Tina. <laughs> well, I was going to say, so what we've done, so I'll, so if I can speak for Region 8, is that, um, you know, we have tribes that are collected macroinvertebrates. Some have done their own in-house identification. Um, typically, that will only get to family levels. So we really have encouraged most of our tribes to, most of the tribes that are located in Region 8 to, um, standardize their sampling procedures, either based on what the state's methods are so that they can look at using the state derived set of um, indices or looking at EPA's national survey methods. Um, and sometimes those are similar to the state methods, um, but that at least ensures that they're following methods that then also 
leads them to an index that they can use for assessment purposes. And then we've encouraged them as well to follow the same um, subsample counts or so whether they're doing 300 organisms or five, 500 organisms and also to follow, um, you know, the, to, to even get the uh, QAQC procedures. So they're following similar, their, their labs are following similar QAQC procedures so that the data are comparable and they can leverage reference site data and they can leverage especially those metrics or indices that are being used by other organizations in their area. Yeah, and so, so Rob, I, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I would say the same thing. I think you want to utilize, uh, if, if the state has a good SOP and a good program in place, I would think you would want to piggyback on that. Um, you know, we, we can certainly help develop that program. Um, if we need to fall back on what EPA uses for the national surveys, we can. Um, that can often be uh, more resource intensive. Um, but I, I think, you know, really with macroinvertebrates, a lot of, of devil is in the details in terms of taxonomic efforts, um, you know, how far down you want to identify those. So a lot of tailoring can be done. Um, and even if you just wanted to start that to establish a baseline of, of what the community looks like now, um, that can still be useful as well. Uh, you know, something that you want to look at now, you get it established, and then you can monitor that over time. So even by itself, it does offer some utility, but in terms of the the larger picture and really, um, you know, telling the story, I think we would rely on the, the state programs. And I also saw that Ed and Mari are on from Region 5. Do you guys have anything from Region 5's perspective that you want to add? I think we would just echo that we've generally re recommended to the tribes that they utilize the state's methods and state's indices because they're generally calibrated to more specific conditions than the RBP methods and things like that. But we certainly don't require it. But there's there's you know benefits to doing that. So I think we echo the same same points. Great. And we we do have Fort Peck's not on here, but Fort Peck Drive in Region Eight has adopted um, numeric bio criteria into their into their standards. They used to, the, the index, the biological index for macroinvertebrates used to actually be in their criteria, their water quality standards. Now it's more in a assessment document that's outside of the criteria document. And Maggie, you jump in here if I'm getting this wrong, um, but it's incorporated by reference. And so that's allowed them as they revise and update the metrics and that are going into their indices um, they, they actually do have that as um, connected to their water quality standards program. So just mention that as well. Okay, Selena, anything else or should I keep going to the next topic? I think we should keep going. I don't see anyone else that has unmuted to speak. So let's move on. Okay, great. So the next topic we're gonna to talk about is, so you've collected this data Hopefully you've collected the, the appropriate kind of data and the right parameters. Now you're going to actually start to look at your data and figure out, okay, what do we, what, what data do I want to assemble for my assessment? So what are the sources of water quality data? Oh, sorry, I tried to remove most of these things, but I didn't get them all. Um, so the first thing we would say, and especially if you've never done an assessment, again, start by looking at your own data. And you know, start by hopefully your data are managed in an electronic format. That'll make things a lot easier. If it is hard copy, then obviously, even before you assess your data, you want to get your data into a format that can be useful and usable, um, whether it's in Excel. Hopefully, most of you are moving your data into um, the WQX system, um, either via whatever route. Our tribes in Region 8 often load their data through Aquams and then load the data um, from there to WQX. Um, so making sure that you're starting by looking at your data, that you're looking at, you know, did we consistently collect the same parameters? So this gets back to the conversation we were just having is, 
if you've measured turbidity for 10 years, but five years you measured them in NTUs, and then you switch to FNUs, then I think the issue is going to be, well, can I compare those data sets? And at least from what we were just talking about, probably not. Um, or sometimes people may start off and they've collected total phosphorus, but they didn't collect total nitrogen. And so again, you have part of the story, but maybe not the whole story. It's just a couple of examples. Um, the other piece that's going to be really important is not just looking at the data itself and the values, but having the associated metadata. And so you know when things were sampled, where and how, that you feel comfortable with the methods and that they were consistently collected. So again, getting back to the macroinvertebrate conversation we were just having, if you started off sampling 100 organisms and identifying them in your own lab to family, and then you switched and you used a different method that aligned with the state's procedures, and you then had them um, sent to a lab where they looked at a 300 organism count, then at the end of the day, you're probably not going to be able to use those data together um, and apply them to, say, a state index. Um, so again, it's just important to think through these things and then hopefully sustain them over time. Um, this also improves the validity of your data, it gives credibility to your data as well, that you know that they're comparable. Um, and it also gives you a richer data set to actually use for your analysis. Okay, so the other thing is, is that when you get your data, and I, I really want to emphasize this because I think a lot of times we, we spend a lot of time in the field, we spend a lot of time, or we, we spend some time thinking about where we're going to sample, what we're going to sample for, and then we spend a lot of time in the field because that's really fun. You get in the field and you get to sample, and then in the end of the day, maybe you analyze your data, which is great. But there's this intermediary step, which is really, do, you, do we spend the sufficient time to look at our data to make sure that we know it's of data quality? And so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit as it relates to these different sources of data. So if you're looking at your tribal data, we want to make sure that you've pulled out your QAP and that you're looking again at what you've written down at your QAP, in your QAP as kind of your key decision points to see if you're going to accept or qualify your data or reject it. Um, sometimes your lab will qualify data because it's missed holding times. Again, that should be rolled into how your data are stored electronically, and you want to make sure those flags are associated with the data. Um, the information in your data management procedures can also document what if I what do I do if I have uh, really high or low values. So before you get into any detailed analysis, you could do something really simple like putting together something that looks at the mins and the max values. And this was, I think, a DO data set. Sorry, I pulled this one in here without including the parameter. And it shows, well, gosh, I've got a value of 1.1. My max was 9.07. I've got 21 data points. So am I comfortable with this value here? And you may want to go back and look at your field notes. You may want to go back and look at your calibration logs to make sure that you feel comfortable that all the data you're going to pull into your analyses are um, of high quality and that there's not any issues. You know, sometimes you may see that it's instead of saying nine, it says 0.9. And you go back to your data, uh, your field sheet, and you say, well, gosh, that was just a data entry error. So it's really taking the time to actually look at your data and to um, check your calculations. If your lab's sending you back, um, calculated values for total nitrogen or other parameters that you've actually taken the time to look at the data and make sure your results are ready to go. Then we're going to talk a little bit about precision and accuracy um, in more in a little in a few slides. Um, you can certainly then do more intensive uh, before you get into analysis. You may want to more intensively look at your data sets to compare it. Um, it's kind of up to you as to how exhaustive you want to be, but it, at least taking the time to make sure the data before it gets fed into an assessment is a, um, that you've looked at the quality of that data is a really important step. Um, so in terms of documenting the data procedures, it's hopefully all of you have some of this information already in your QAP. If you don't, there's also kind of this intermediary step, which is whether it's a state or a tribe or a watershed organization, 
really anybody who's out there doing sampling should really document their process for how they collect, manage, and store their data, um, where they store their paper files, because you often may need to go to them, um, how you transfer your hard copy results to an electronic database, who reviews the results once you've um, transferred them, is there like 10% of this of the data that are reviewed by your QA, QC officer? Um, what's your process for maintaining da backup databases? So, you know, if somebody leaves a program and, you know, just deletes a bunch of files that you're sure you have those things on record. And then as much as possible, if you can even identify who's the point of contact for each of these tasks so that you know, if I have questions, I'm going to go find, you know, Joe to talk about the paper files and get those hard copies that were stored five years ago. Um, the other thing is, this is just a reminder that if you collect data using one of six funding, it must be shared. So it does need to go to WQX. Um, if you collect data with other resources, if you're getting money from the tribe directly or through other funding mechanisms, then you don't have to share it. It doesn't have to be shared with EPA. So now on to some other sources. So if at the end of the day you look at your data or you're starting your assessment, you may just decide to focus on the tribe's data and do an assessment based on the tribal data. But as you as your program and as your analyses kind of advances, then you may say, well, gosh, I want to consider other data and information that's out there. And you may do it because you realized, well, I, I, I have sites, I have data from this particular sampling location, but I I don't have it the entire length of the stream segment, or I want to know what goes on down here. So the idea is that you can look more holistically at data sets from other organizations to help fill in those data gaps. Um, and then there may be other information that is that is relevant to your program. Um, also, as I mentioned before, this is a requirement in terms of looking at existing and readily available data if you are doing a uh, task for 303D. So what are some other types of data that you can consider? And I, I should note that if you're, we're gonna talk, um, we're gonna, Selena's gonna do a demo of the portal at the end of the webinar. Um, there's also other data sets like for tribes that are using Aquams. Aquams actually has on its website, you can get the data that's available through the portal. So you can look at USGS data, other agency data that's been loaded to the portal. So there's a variety of different tools that help facilitate looking at other data sets. Um, some other data sets that you may want to consider are things like volunteer monitoring data, beach closures, if there's a, if you have a game and fish organization and they're collection, collecting data on fish consumption advisories or fish kills, that can be really helpful. Um, there's also source water assessments, and then there's some just general background information related to land use or hydrology that can help, again, inform your assessment decisions. So a couple of other sources, if you're trying to figure out, well, where should I go for data and information? Um, a number of federal agencies, again, collect data. You're probably already familiar with this. USGS has a ton of, ton of fleet stream flow data. They also have data from continuous loggers. They may also do site-specific studies paid for um, by the state or other agencies. And again, this is all available through the portal. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service can often have information on threatened and endangered species. Uh, that's really helpful to look at. Forest Service actually maintains a number of monitoring programs. So if you can access their data, that can be helpful as well. It could include biological information, habitat data. It will vary by agency. Additionally, there's a number of tribal agencies that may have kind of a range of possible data. Um, you may have BIA may have information or IHS. Sometimes IHS has information that talks about, you know, are people, if you're sampling or you're concerned about groundwater and you want to know what are, you know, people using in terms of drinking water, where they get their drinking water from, you might be able to find that out through these agencies. Again, Game and Fish may even have fish population estimate information that's really helpful. Um, and then sometimes they have just additional information that might be useful to your assessment, including water quality data, septic and system information, et cetera. And then, of course, there's also the state agencies. Um, these will vary. So many states will have a Department of Environmental Protection or Department of Environmental Quality. A lot of these data, if you haven't been to this website, now EPA does have How's My Waterway. This um, 
it will help you locate if there's a specific water body that you're interested in. You can actually pull that water body up and it will show you what that water body is listed for on the state's 303D list, what are the pollutants of concern, um, et cetera. So this is a helpful resource that's now available. Uh, departments of Natural Resources may collect flow data. They may have information that's helpful related to water rights. And then again, Departments of Health may have information on advisories or um, any human health related concerns that could be relevant to the attainment decision. And then there's also local agencies. So there's the local Department of Health. They may have septic system information. Some Departments of Health actually collect water quality data at least in Montana, it just varies. Water utilities, maybe you're looking at, well, gosh, what are the impacts on aquatic life related to this wastewater discharge? And you may be able to get a sense of, well, what is the effluent concentration for that wastewater discharge? And what, is it, what does water quality look like upstream of the discharge versus downstream? You can also get drinking water monitoring data. And then again, some soil and water conservation districts may have data that's helpful that you can provide, that you can obtain. And then last but not least, there's also universities and watershed groups. Again, I think it's important to keep in mind what's when you're starting to look at data, don't get overwhelmed because you can spend your whole time just looking for the data, compiling the data in a usable format before you ever get to the attainment decision. So while it's great to know that you may want to contact these other agencies or partners to see what information might be out there. I think it's also, you know, as you're just starting into the assessment process, it's important to keep it manageable. So that's kind of the balancing act. So when you are asking for data, you know, be as specific. If you have a format that you want the data in, ask them if they can provide it in a particular format. You know, let them know, no, I don't need your entire, you know, 30 years of data, I'm just looking at for data for the last five years or two years, whatever the case may be. Um, make sure that it, you get a name of a person because sometimes you get data sets, they get emailed to you and then you have questions. And so it's like, well, who's the most knowledgeable person um, so that we can follow up? Um, how should we have additional questions? And then if they can provide a QAP or any related metadata, that's gonna be really helpful for you to evaluate the quality. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, data formatting can take you some time. So again, I think this is something that the more data you get from different partners, the more likely you're gonna spend some time on data cleanup, data review, and then data formatting so that it's in a useful format. So I'm gonna stop there for one second before we move into the kind of data quality considerations. Are there any quick questions on sources or anything anybody wanted to mention before we move into kind of the data quality consideration component. Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling just for the sake of time. So now most of you have written QAPs and that's your quality assurance app element where you've, you've got a program, you've written a QAP and I'm sure you all love to get that QAP out and revise it every year. Um, Quaps are kind of one of those dreaded tools, but, but I am gonna spend some time re-emphasizing why we write quaps. And really the quap, once you write it down, that's only part of, the, part of it. It's really like now you need to implement the quap. And so that's this data con quality control data you collected in the field. And then how do you look at it? So I, I want us to really uh, give some credit to you know, the QA, QC part of our programs and make sure we're, we're spending the time we need to look at QA, QC. So as I mentioned, uh, the QAP is developed. Everybody has, I'm sure, a primary QAP if you're doing monitoring. So primary QAP is you're going out and collecting samples and you write yourself a QAP. If you are going to pull in data from other sources and you're going to analyze that data for your attainment decisions, then you're going to need what's called a secondary QAP. And we have examples. So you know, if you, if you need a secondary QAP, to look at other data, let us know and we can give you some examples. So in your QAP, you establish these data quality objectives. And so that says, here's how much data I need, here's the types of data I need. Um, and you've really hopefully arti well articulated what are your key monitoring questions? What are your study objectives? Are you looking at trends over time? Are you looking at 
attainment of specific designated uses? Are you looking at impacts from climate change? Whatever it may be. In the example we're talking about for this webinar series, it's mostly, you know, are my, I'm gonna say aquatic life uses or recreational uses, whatever your designated uses are, are those being met? Those are kind of your DQOs. And you've said, okay, well, what's the type of data I need to collect? And then what are my um, acceptable levels for decision errors? And so within that um, framework of the QAP, you also then establish these data quality indicators, and they are indicative of the quanti quantitative and qualitative measures of the quality of the data. So it gets at these measures, you've often probably heard of them called the PARC parameters. Um, then there's the bias piece too, so it's PARC plus B, but it's accuracy, pre precision, bias, representativeness, comparability, and completeness. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of those. So what is accuracy? Accuracy is basically you want to know the value you collected and the result that you're getting is as close to accurate or the true value as possible. So um, you, this is why we collect blanks. So this is why we you know, collect a blank is so that we know that, for example, um, I know that I'm going out, I'm collecting pesticide data. And if I'm putting on my own insect repellent because I'm worried about bugs and mosquitoes that I'm not contaminating a blank and impacting the value. And so that's why if we know that, you know, with blanks that we're, we're seeing, okay, well, we didn't contaminate the sample, there's no field contamination occurring, then we have a better sense of the result represents the true value. This is also where all the laboratory QA, QC methods come into play because you want to make sure that there's no instrumentation error going on in the lab that could inf affect the result as well. Um, accuracy is impacted by precision and bias, and we're going to talk about them next. So precision is basically when you're collecting duplicate samples. So it's basically the degree to which two or more measurements agree. Um, and so you can be really precise, but you can be biased. So that's why these two fit together. And I'll show you a, a schematic in a minute that kind of highlights that fact. Um, Precision is telling you the, the measurement of scatter in the results. So, you know, if it's highly precise and you're not going to have a lot of scatter, they're all going to be clumped together. If you're less precise, then your measurements could be all over the place. And really what you're trying to do is, you know, get a sense of, okay, well, what's my measure of my true value and how close am I to it? And for precision, one of the ways we often look at precision with duplicates is we calculate the relative percent difference. Um, from the two duplicate samples. Um, bias is where we have a systematic error or a persistent distortion in the data. So let's say we have a pH meter and I haven't replaced the probe in years. And so I'm getting an error, I'm getting a reading, but the readings are always bias low. And so my, my because I haven't calibrated my meter or because I haven't replaced my probe, I may have, um, uh, an error that is just persistently biasing my data high or low, it can, it can vary. And so let's look quickly at this schematic. So, you know, you, you can have situations where you have, in this case, you have bias, so you're biased in this direction, um, and you have low precision. So this could be an example of the pH meter that I was talking about. So you've got your bias because of your pH meter, and you're all over the board in terms of your precision. Um, you could also have a situation like this, which is your, you know, it can affect your accuracy, which is you have certain things that aren't necessarily super precise. So when we go out and we collect chlorophyll samples for benthic chlorophyll, we know there's a lot of variability. So our ability to be precise, like here, where we're hitting the bullseye is gonna be much harder because we know that chlorophyll is patchy, benthic chlorophyll is patchy. And so the results we see may be um, there may be a lot of low precision in those situations. Our goal is obviously low bias and high precision. And this is what, why we want to make sure that the lab instruments are as, you know, on target, they're following their QA, QC procedures, so we know that they're accurate in terms of the results. Um, also, we, you know, we're using our blanks to know that we're actually getting an accurate value. Um, here is an example of we're being very precise but there's also a high bias. So we're not hitting our true value because we're biased. 
Um, so this is why we, you know, we collect blanks, we collect dupes in the field is to really get a sense of how close to this bullseye are we getting? Or are there things that are affecting our data quality that we need to be aware of? So the other QA, QC parameter is representativeness. And, oh, sorry. So representativeness is like, okay, well, I took a sample and I took one sample mid-reach and it is supposed to represent 30 miles of stream. Or I took a sample in one bay of a lake, but it's supposed to represent the entire lake. Um, or I took a sample and it's right within mixing zone downstream of a wastewater treatment plant, and it's supposed to represent the general conditions in the river. So it's important to really look at representativeness and make sure um, that they're reflecting the population that we're interested in. Um, and so for example, if you, if you didn't get enough samples then maybe you need to go out and collect additional samples. Um, in other cases, you may you know, just need, this could be a study design component as much as it is a data collection component in terms of representativeness. Um, comparability we've touched on a little bit, but the idea is that you, you know, the turbidity example, you want to make sure that the data you're collecting can be compared to other studies. So if you're collecting turbidity data and you collect it in FNUs and you want to compare it to NTUs, that's going to be a problem. Um, if you want to use the same macroinvertebrate standardized sampling protocols and analytical methods over time, and if you change them, that could be a problem. And in the plot to the right, and Maggie will recognize this plot. It's a recent one where we've been looking at some data sets for diatoms. And we're hoping what we're seeing, the orange represents reference sites, blue represent not reference sites, so impaired sites. And we're hoping that this is saying, look, at here's how these um, reference sites are grouping together. And it's very different than these impaired sites. However, the sampling methods have not been standardized over time. And especially the analytical methods may or may not have been standardized eyes over time. This could be simply that one taxonomist did this analysis and another taxonomist did this analysis. So those are the reasons why it's really important to make sure your methods are comparable. Because at the end of the day, you want to know, hey, I can answer my question and know that these two things are separate populations and it's not an artifact of different analytical methods or different sampling protocols. So it's important if you do change your procedures to document those so that you know when they happened and that may help explain your data set at the end. And then completeness is one where you're looking at both, like I said I was going to sample um, X number of times during the growing season so that I can look at the growing season concentration for chlorophyll or for nutrients and for whatever reason, I only sampled once or twice. And so, you know, is that a complete data set? Is that representative? It kind of ties to representativeness. Is that representative of current conditions? Is a single sample representative of those conditions? Or it's also a situation where you want to look at, okay, I collected data, I ran it through my QC procedures, because it's not just did I collect all the sampling at all the locations that I said I was going to, with the frequency that I said I was going to, but it's also did all of my data and my results pass those QC procedures that I put in place and how many valid results do I have or did I have problems with so many data sets being flagged or in this case, like preserved with the wrong acid. So, you, you know, they didn't, they in this case still had enough to meet the percent completeness um, goal, but in other cases, you may not. So again, this is important to take a look at before you start analyzing your data because it's going to give you an indication of whether you have the right data you need to answer the questions. This is just a real basic. Um, this is not necessarily like, don't go off and use this as an example. It's just something I threw in here. The, the main point is take a look at your QC Take a look at your data, take a look at your blanks and dupes, and then document it. Put it in writing somewhere so that people know, hey, we looked at the data and we determined that it was credible for these reasons, or we made these decisions um, and we, you know, we had to make these fixes or these corrections based on um, these particular findings. So that's so just documenting it gives you a record as to how you made your decisions. So if there's any questions in a couple of years from now as to why certain data weren't included 
or what changes were made um, that you have a record of those decisions. So just in summary for this section, um, to give you a sense, this is, you know, just your, when you take a look at your data and you're prepping it for analysis, you're reviewing your DQOs, you're also reviewing your precision, accuracy, all those data quality indicators. Um, and you're seeing, okay, does it meet what we specified in our QAP? So you're kind of dusting off the QAP and applying those uh, decision rules that you've outlined in that document to your data set before you analyze it. And then if you actually have other data that you're considering, um, then you still apply your QAP. Hopefully it's a secondary data QAP. And then again, you see, does it meet the, those data quality requirements that we specified in that QAP? Um, so at that point, you've completed, you know you've got credible data, you've ensured you have appropriate data quality, so you can prep your data for analysis. And so this is where then you need to start looking at your data through a slightly different lens, which is, okay, well, have I done a good job of noting the parameters and the methods used? Do I have consistent units? And then particularly prepping for the next stage of the assessment, what's the date range I'm going to use? And what are my data sufficiency expectations? So parameters versus methods. So parameters, when you're looking at parameters or characteristics, uh, to use terminology from WQX, parameters can have many forms. So you can have total nitrogen. Um, this is an example on the right where it says, here's the method identification, and then here's the description, descriptive method name. So there's many different analytical methods tied to individual parameters. And so it's really important when you're storing your data to know, am I looking at, whoops, sorry. Am I looking at total nitrogen data? Am I looking at total Keldahl data, nitrate, nitrate? You know, you can have various analytical methods maybe assigned to one of those parameters, but you wanna make sure that you know what parameter you're looking at and that somebody hasn't mislabeled something that's nitrate as total nitrogen. Um, so it's really important, especially with nutrients, because they have a number of different fractions and then they have a number of different methods and parameter and mainly methods and fractions um, to know exactly what you're looking at. Um, EPA has a guidance document on this. It's like a kind of a recommended best practices document. So if you're collecting nutrient data, we can certainly provide that to you to make sure that you're storing it appropriately and you know what, what uh, characteristic name to give. And um, then also it highlights some of the analytical methods. So the analytical method is also just basically the method that's to used to determine the concentration of the parameter. Um, and it, as I mentioned before, you can have several analytical methods that apply to the same parameter. And so that's where it's really important. I don't know how you guys handle the data, but a lot of the data for Region 8, um, for tribes that are in Region 8, goes straight from the lab to the tribe and then gets sent to gold systems and they migrate those data sets to um, Aquams and then on to WQX. And one of the things they're always looking at is they're checking the analytical methods to make sure they align with the parameter and that it's relevant for that parameter. And if there's any questions, then the questions go back directly to the lab. Um, also looking at noting your detection limits is important because you may at the end of the day have a bunch of values that are below the detection limit and um, you, you're gonna want to know what the detection li limit is to know how you treat those data sets in your analysis. Um, the other thing that can occur is sometimes you can store data and have a bunch of different units um, and that you know, it could be that you have a microgram, milligram uh, situation, but you just want to make sure you're, you know, not blending these two without converting your units. Sometimes it's a data cleanup issue to just make sure you've standardized based on your units. This is an example of the NTU, FT, FNU. So this would be an example of, hey, I don't want to blend these data sets because I can't compare them. Um, the other thing too is also looking at the date range. So it could be that when you're getting ready to prep your data for analysis that you say, I want to look at um, data within a two-year range or five-year range. Um, some states will use 10 years as kind of their, what they'll call it, a general date range for assessments. 
Um, and then it's important to know, well, do I have the data I'm going to need or do I just have a fraction of the data that I need? Um, why did I maybe not collect data during certain time frames? And then also it's important to note that you may have older samples and those older samples may still be representative of current condition. So it's going to depend on kind of looking at the data sets, looking at your watershed. Did anything change in terms of land use? Is there any alteration in flow? What concerns? Why, why would I be concerned with not with using the older data? And so you can't just exclude data solely because of their source or their reign or their date um, and the age of the data. You need to actually look at it and say, I'm not going to use these data because you know, those data are 10 years old. And since that time, the land use, there's been a ton of development in the watershed. It's, it's very different in terms of conditions that we see now than what existed 10 years ago. So it doesn't mean you have to use it, but you at least have to look at it to see if it is representative of your current time frame that's of interest for your attainment decision. Um, the other thing as you start to head into attainment decisions is saying, okay, well, how much, what is my minimum data set? And so if you have a minimum data set, it's like, okay, well, am I going to make a decision in my attainment framework? And we'll talk about this more in the next um, webinar, but just to kind of wet your whistle, are you going to be um, making a decision based on a single sample? Or do you want to say, well, no, I'm going to require three samples be collected for, say, pH or temperature. Or maybe you say, well, I'm going to recommend that, you know, with my field data, because I can get out and collect that routinely with a parameter, with a probe, I'm going to make my minimum data set at least 10 samples collected over X period of time. But for lab samples, I'm going to say those are more costly. And so we think it's realistic that we're going to collect you know, three samples per year uh, for lab samples. And we're going to use that as we move forward with our attainment decision. And so it's important to kind of think about how much data you want um, and then design your monitoring program to, with the goal that your completeness objective is going to be that you're going to collect those samples and enough samples to meet your data sufficiency recommendations. Um, the other thing you're going to want to think about is how you're looking at the data. Are you going to analyze the data by site? Or if you have a longer stream segment, are you going to be aggregating data? And if so, if you're going to aggregate data, are the sites representative of the entire stream reach? Or did you have a major tributary that came in? And so therefore, you want to break it up into kind of sites located upstream of the tributary versus downstream of the tributary. Um, and then what happens if you don't meet your minimum data set? Well, in some cases, you may say, I've got to go collect more data. But in some cases, you may say, gosh, I've got metals data that are really screaming high and they're exceeding the Q criterion by an order of magnitude. So I'm going to consider that overwhelming evidence. And even though I haven't met that goal of having 10 samples or three samples, I'm still going to go ahead and complete my assessment just based on the um, magnitude of the exceedance. So this is just an example. Uh, for a situation where you may be looking at data. And in this case, there was a lot of E. coli data. There was a real focus on recreational uses. But then when it came to time to do an aquatic life use assessment, they basically had one or two samples. So it's it going to be one of those situations where it's like, really, do I feel comfortable saying that I'm attaining my aquatic life uses with such a small data set? And I think we're close here to the end, but just again, then the, the final thing you're going to be doing is making sure your data are ready to go. You can organize your data on a spreadsheet. If you're interested in using R, other software packages that are out there now, you know, spreadsheets, just one tool, you can certainly use others. Um, and again, as we talked about before, you just want to, before you launch into analysis, make sure everything's consistent, dates, parameter names, Etc. cetera, um, you're looking for decimal points, you're looking for any data entry errors, um, anything that's going to make, once you get into the data crunching part, it's going to be an error and a problem. You're just trying to do some data cleanup here. And so in summary, um, I think we've talked about most of these issues, but you know, identify the data you're going to use, what parameters are of most interest and are rele relevant to the designated use that you're trying to assess for, uh, consider whether you're going to 
focus on your data set from the tribe or other non-tribal data sets, look at compiling information on how the data were generated, and then actually screen the data for any obvious problems so that you can determine if it's quality data that you want to use. And then establish, you know, if you don't use data, certainly document the reasons why you have decided not to use those data. So hopefully this has been helpful for you all and maybe touched on a few topics or reminded you of a few things that you are already familiar with. Um, but the idea being that if you're going to be moving forward with an assessment, you're looking at, in this case, it says all existing and readily available data. Again, I would say you can start your assessment process by focusing on, focusing on your tribal data set and then move into other broader sources of data. Um, use data that might be available from other sources if you have the time and resources or when you're ready for it. Go back and revisit your QAP and your DQOs and use it to review your data quality to make sure it's credible and you're ready to move forward and use it in the analysis. Um, and then also um, use that information to determine if you're going to use data from external sources as well. And with that, I'm going to pause, see if there's any questions, and then um, Selena, hopefully that left you a little bit of time to go through the slides for the portal if there's not too many questions. So I'll stop there. And questions are the most important right now. So if you guys have questions, now's your time. Go ahead and ask. We do have a comment in the chat box that says awesome job in addressing the plethora of issues and solutions, truly well thought out and very helpful. So if anyone else has questions, feel free to ask them now or put them in the chat box. I guess I had a question for this group, not knowing everybody's background. I don't know, I mean, I know we've, um, recently gone through, I mean, I, I think looking at your data and I don't, I'd be curious to know if, if folks have looked at their data and said, oh gosh, okay, here's some common issues we find when we're looking at our data, um, whether it's, you know, data quality, like we were looking at some data sets the other day and there was kind of an accuracy precision issue because the data were collected, it was metals data, but the detection limit was above the standard. So the results were all non-detect, but the um, detection limits were above the criteria. And so then the question is, well, okay, how confident do we feel that we're actually meeting the water quality standards? So the suggestion there was, no, we need a different lab that's actually going to have a lower detection limit. So I don't know if any of you all have encountered similar situations um, and want to share those. Um, I always think examples are helpful. Hey Tina, this is Rob in Region Six, and uh, you know we, we've you mentioned the uh, nutrient screening values, you know, for total phosphorus, total nitrogen, how we can, so, you know, assist the tribes and provide those numbers. I have seen a couple instances where those screening levels were lower than what the lab was providing, so it was essentially the same thing that you saw with the metals. And so, yeah, we just kind of used it as, uh, you know, a learning experience. You know, it's part of the natural evolution of the program. And so, yeah, we move on to, to a lab that can provide a little bit better resolution. Yeah, thanks, Rob. That's a great example. I, and I don't know, Ed, if from Region 5, I mean, a lot of times we find that in by spending the time looking at data quality, it it sometimes doesn't move us forward with assessment or analysis. It moves us into improvements in our monitoring and our analytical methods. So if there's other examples or other questions, feel free to chime in, folks. Anyone else? No question is too small. Also, I wanted to add, if anyone has any questions after the fact and you think about it later, you can email it to me and I can forward it on to Tina. 
Thanks, Karen. The other thing I just say, and then and I'll turn it back to you, is if folks have like standard processes that they're using to look at their data quality and kind of apply their QAP and say, okay, are we, you know, yes, we're ready to go. Um, those examples would be great um, to be able to take a look at because we're always looking at, you know, a lot of people do kind of an informal review of their data, but they may or may not document it. So if people take the time to generate a report or have a process that you've written down that documents how you go through your data quality review, um, that would be, I think, really helpful if folks are willing to share it. Okay, and I see we have another comment in the chat asking um, to get the, the presentation slides. Uh, we will look into that and getting those out if we can. And also, we're recording this today, so um, you can go on to the website in a few days. Also, um, I will email out the recording in a couple of days and I'll post it on the website so you can look at it that way also. And it has It'll show the PowerPoint presentation and it has closed captioning. So, you know, if that's, that's a way you want to look at it. That's fine. Um, and also if Tina would, wouldn't mind sharing her presentation. If anyone would like a copy of that, if she sends that to me, I can also share that with, with everyone. If, if you would like that. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to share the presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go over the water quality data portal really quickly since we only have a few minutes left. Karen, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, yes it is. Okay. All right, it looks like it's trying to. Um, Are most of you guys familiar with the water quality data portal and how to pull data out of it? I see some no's, I see some yeses. Okay, I don't know why my screen is not did, did you click on the share? Share there it is. There yeah. now it's okay. trying. <laughs> did it go or not? Um, we can see the WebEx screen now. Now we can see it. Okay, perfect. This is what you're going to see when you come to the water quality data portal, and um, you can see the address up here: waterqualitydata.us. If you just Google water quality data portal. Uh, it'll bring you to this page. If you click here on download data, you will see here that there are a lot of ways to search for what you're looking for. Uh, country, state, county. If you are looking by county, you will have to populate the state first. If you know the lat long of your station, you can put that in. And if you want to... Um, do it by a box, basically draw a box and you have lat long for uh, those coordinates. Um, that's what you would use this bounding box for. Uh, some other ways to search and how I commonly search are right here by organization ID. So I'll just type someone in here and look them up, but you can also look by site type. So if you want surface water, if you want groundwater, you can bound by those things as well. You've got all of these choices here. Um, but I am going to uh, search for Sack and Fox because I already talked to Dale and he said I could show some of his information. Um, also, more specifically, if you have your site ID, you can put that here. You can also search by Huck. Uh, you can also search by a specific sample media, biology, habitat, sediment. You can also search by characteristic group or just a, a characteristic. So you could type oxygen, for instance, and pick which oxygen you want to search for. 
or you could leave all of these blank and that will pull up all of the data that there are. I also very commonly use this date range because I'm usually looking for a specific range based on the assessment report that I currently have in. Uh, if you're not entirely sure uh, where your site is, or especially if you're looking for a USGS gauge, you can pop out this map. And if you know your area, I'm going to search for East Cache Creek. And if it works. If not, um, but you can click on these little triangles uh, to get some information here. Look like, looks like we've got West Cache Creek. And you can move around in here. Um, you can click this open. It'll give you more um, information uh, about this particular gauge station if you like. And then coming further down here, uh, you can pick the type of sample results you want. Uh, typically, we're looking for a physical chemical habitat. Um, I, I'm just fine with this coming out in a comma separated format. You would click download and it would show you how your or how many samples uh, you have, how many results, and from how many different sites. So I'm going to cancel that um, so that it doesn't take time to download. But you have a lot of options to search in here. And I'm going to show you, this is what it, it spits out. So I've hidden a lot of columns in here, but we've got our uh, location identifier. We've got our characteristic name. So you can sort if you wanted to look at a particular site in here. So we'll do Rock Creek and we'll look for chloride and that'll pop up our data. Uh, this is important for you to be able to go back and check the data that you have uploaded into WQX, into the portal. Um, again, if you were looking for, say, information on a stream that goes into the waters that you're interested in, you can find a station there, if there is one that exists, and pull those data out for yourself. And I know that was a really quick overview, um, but I just wanted to give you guys an idea uh, before we ran out of time. Are there any quick questions about that? Okay. If not, you guys know how to reach me, send me an email, contact Karen, um, and we can get any questions answered. Is there anything else? That you guys want to ask really quickly? Okay, um, then I think with that, uh, we can end. Karen, do you have anything else? No, I just wanted to thank Tina and you, Selena, today for doing the training for us. And if there's not any other questions, we'll go ahead and um, in this session, any more questions? Last chance. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and everyone have a good day and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.